All right. Welcome back. Greetings and welcome back to Blackbird News where everything is connected. How are you all doing? Good to see you all here. Um, it's good to be back. Had a little break yesterday, which is fine. Um, hello, YouTube people. Yeah, Lone Wolf, I, I saw that story. Saudis are stealing Arizona water for pennies and taking millions. Yes. Saw that one. I think I covered that one on the show. Maybe it was a couple of weeks back. I don't know. What's up, uh, Rockfin people? How you doing? How you doing, Rockfin people? And we're live on Colin as well, where you can call into the show. Um, uh, <coughs> woo, excuse me. Um, quickly, before we get into things, I just wanted to give a shout out to the people that tipped me after hours. Sweetleaf tipped me um, after the last show. Thank you, Sweetleaf. It was a it was a nice tip. And William Dillon bought three coffees from me. Thank you, William. Uh, you can support the show at buymeacoffee.com slash Black Bear News. Many people do it that way. Let me, uh, I don't know, I'm all, I'm all shifted in the weirdest way here. Uh, there we go. And also got a tip already on today's show on Rockfin from Juliet Nickel. Thank you, Juliet. I appreciate it. She said, thank you, BBN. Your effort towards creating the show does not go unnoticed. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's cover some things. Let's get into it. Just... There are already too many things to cover and not enough time. Never enough time, but we try. Um, so this is from uh, Mark Cranfield. On the left, James Hansen confirms that the eventual equilibrium temperature for 560 parts per million CO2, including slow feedbacks, is 6 Celsius. On the right, Andrew Glickson confirms that the current CO2 equivalent, so it's important to understand what equivalent, CO2 equivalent, we have, according to Mauna Loa, we have um, four around 420 parts per million now, but we also have other gases in the air that are also heat-trapping gases. And they have, right, methane, nitrous oxide, et cetera. And they also have a certain rate of heating. So you can add all these, you know, all the heating rates of the gases together and find a CO2 equivalent, which is 563 parts per million, which is uh, not good. Makes no, make, no mis make no mistake, this means the planet is committed to 6C plus heating. A theory committed means I'm just trying to I'm just trying to lay it out for the lay person, right? Committed means we haven't caught up to the equivalent of CO2 in the atmosphere yet. I know. That sounds bad. Right? We're at 420 now, but we still haven't. There's a lag time between the release of the gas and the heating, the ult ultimate heating it will create. And that doesn't look good. Not at all. I can tell you that is depressing. <laughs> Peter Dines covering, uh, there's some flash flooding in London. Uh, it's usually not common at this time of year. The climate is being altered, and that means more severe weather patterns. So here is, you know, just some. People driving 
there's floods in London. Floods, 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 floods. I saw a, a conspiracy bot. Anybody follow conspiracy bot on Twitter? Um, I don't know if I can find this quickly. Probably not. Somebody posted something about how they're creating all the droughts and the floods with chemtrails. Uh, you know, not, I'm not saying that chemtrails aren't real. I'm not saying that they aren't, you know, fully aware of what spraying the skies or altering the skies or that they can create clouds. Actually, that's my, my theory is that they understand how to create clouds. It's not very hard. Right, you put a contrail up, it kind of spreads out and creates this cloud. And they're like, oh, creates a cloud. What does a cloud do? Cools. Can you create more rain? Sure. You can seed, seed clouds. Um, but I don't think that's what's going on. Anyways, it was kind of an interesting video from a conspiracy point. But it was like... Mm. But I know that's what a lot of people think. A lot of people are very resistant to the idea that that climate change is an actual thing that's happening. They're very resistant, and then they – it's fine if you have an idea of what's going on, but if your idea doesn't carry – you know, doesn't actually have – you know, it might have a little science behind it or a couple of science-y sounding things. <clears throat> There's the difference between – you know, rock solid science and sciencey sounding things. And, you know, lots of people like to use sciencey sounding things to make it sound like they know what they're talking about. Um, again, it would be, I would be more interested in these theories if there was just more evidence, just more observable data and evidence, you know, just a couple of things, you know, my theory on, on, clouds creating clouds is just a theory um only things that i observe that look like i you know it looks pretty obvious to me but still for me to actually go that's actually what that's absolutely what they're doing i would need more data and evidence um so i don't know i don't know i don't know how we how i got off that way but um, again, I'm not dismissive of the chemtrail thing. I absolutely think that they, you know, they already understand how geoengineering works. They fully understand it. Possibly they're implementing in some things, you know, in some places, but it still doesn't override the whole, like we are geoengineering the planet with release of CO2 and methane and every, right. We've just, we're digging up the things, we're burning them, lighting them on fire, <laughs> putting them in our cars, putting them in our, you know, running our houses off them, right? That's a form of geoengineering. That's the main one going on on the planet that you could see with your eyeballs, right? That's the one that's, it's very obvious. You just, you know, go out. I don't know if you have a smokestack near your house, just go out and look at the smokestack, watch it puff things up into the air. Go out and stand, and, uh, you know, uh, on an overpass on a freeway and just watch the millions of cars just streaming down the road 24 hours a day, puffing stuff out, up into the air. That's pretty observable. That's pretty pretty obvious. It's an obvious form of geoengineering right there. The one that's like in plain sight, right? The in plain sight geoengineering that people are like, nah, that's not happening. You know, that's not doing anything. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? You ever stood behind a bus? For a couple, maybe a couple minutes? <laughs> you ever stood behind a, a diesel trailer? Doesn't feel good. Oh, oh, it's not doing anything? Are you sure? Okay. Sure. Anyways. <clears throat> Australia, 
Uh, this is from extreme temperatures. Australia between deluges and scorching heat. Today, 23rd of October, 24 stations broke the records of wettest October day in the south. So they're getting hammered with rain. And while in the north, the heat is intensifying with temperatures reaching 44.3 C at Wyndham Airport. That, so wild, you know, pretty wild extremes there going on in Australia. That's hot. 44 C. Almost 44 and a half C. That's, that's real warm. Real toasty. All right. This is actually, I want to read this article because it's super interesting. Very interesting. You all heard about how the Saudis kind of snubbed Joe Biden and the U.S. by slashing oil production. They actually wanted to do it more. <laughs> they wanted to make it way worse. But let's read this article and see, you know, I don't know. This, uh, um, <laughs> Creative Experiments is asking me if I ever rolled coal before. Yeah, no. No, that ain't, that ain't my bag. <laughs> That's not my bag. Oh, I was going to say before I read this. Uh, you know, after reading this, you know, when, when people say that all the wars are over oil, um, thanks, Denver. Denver always drops like really interesting links. Yeah. Oh, I understand. I, I understand. Denver, totally. Weather modification is a well-studied thing by the military. Absolutely. It's not, it's not an unknown, right? When they say like, oh, we think, we think we're going to run some tests in Sweden later next year and figure out how this works. Yeah. You know, like, it's so dumb. <laughs> like, they totally know how everything works. They've definitely figured that out, whether, you know. Now, conversely, though, there, you know, they know that it's a dangerous game and there's, that's why there is actually, there was like a convention, a moratorium on playing with the atmosphere on weather modification, right? They, you know, you guys can't do this. Don't do this. Cause it's bad. Kind of like, uh, the moratorium, you know, there, you're not supposed to do gain of function research, right? That's. Because it's super dangerous, right? You don't know the unintended consequences from this is really bad. Now, that doesn't mean that people aren't doing it anyways. I'm just saying, outwardly, the scientists and the governments are like, we know this is really bad. We're not supposed to do this. So they understand. They understand that part of it. Um, but thanks for, thanks for the links, Denver. I appreciate it. Always very interesting. But I, yeah, I'm sure they, you know, they have pat patents and we know this. Um, all right, let's keep going. Okay. So I want to read this article cause this, this is a very, you know, it's fairly obvious. Um, and it's concerning, but it also points, this article points to how much of a death grip oil has on the you know the economies and the and the governments of the world um that's the other thing too is just like if you're if you're trying to find out you know you're trying to figure out like the the bad people that are running the planet um and they're up to all these schemes and you know if you really think that they care about climate change you, you know or that somehow they're going to get us off of uh, an oil-based economy. It's just not, it's not going to happen. So they're, their uh, assertion that they're going to do something about climate change, if they're not actually doing something about the fossil fuel companies or actually weaning people off of an oil-based economy, 
and I don't, you know, I don't even know how we even start to do that. Then they're they're just not serious. Anyways, <clears throat> I've t- I've taken too long. Saudis sought oil production cut so deep it surprised even Russia. This is from the Intercept. Um, the Saudi-led oil cartel OPEC Plus announcement their pl- announcement earlier this month that it was cutting two million barrels of oil per day. A move that would drive up the price of oil just a month before midterm elections rankled Democrats in Washington. They accused Riyadh of aligning itself with Russia, another powerful member of OPEC+, Plus, which would indeed profit off of the move. What Saudi Arabia did to help Putin continue to wage his despicable, vicious war against Ukraine will long be remembered by Americans, said Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. What Saudi Arabia actually pushed to cut oil production twice as much as Russian President Vladimir Putin, surprising the Russians. Two Saudi sources with knowledge of the negotiations told The Intercept, suggesting that Riyadh's move, uh, motives run deeper than what top Democrats want to admit. The sources requested anonymity, fearing reprisal by the Saudi government. Public reporting has hinted at Saudi Arabia's drive for a far more aggressive production cut than Russia, as well as other OPEC Plus members first sought. On September 27th, Reuters reported that Russia favored a 1 million barrel per day cut, just half of what later would be agreed upon. Then on October 5th, OPEC Plus announced that it would be cutting 2 million barrels a day. On October 14th, the White House's National Security Council spokesperson, John Kirby, said that more than one OPEC Plus member Members disagreed about the cut, but were coerced by Saudi Arabia into going along with it, but he declined to specify which countries. The OPEC Plus members who privately pushed back against the cut include Kuwait, Iraq, Bahrain, and even the United Arab Emirates, a close ally of Saudi Arabia's, according to the Wall Street Journal. These countries reportedly feared that the production cuts could lead to a recession that would ultimately reduce demand for oil. Saudi Arabia, a putative ally, has pushed for even deeper cuts than what Russia, a U.S. US advisory, even believed they could get away with, the sources said. People in D.C. think MBS is siding with Putin, but I think MBS is even more Putinian than Putin, one of the sources a Saudi close to the royal family said, referring to Saudi Arabia's de facto ruler, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. While Saudi Arabia has maintained that the move was motivated solely by economic interests, the White House and other top Democrats have said that the Saudis are pursuing a conscious alignment with Russia. The Saudi foreign ministry can try to spin or deflect, but the facts are simple, Kirby said, alleging that they knew that the oil production cut would increase Russian revenues and blunt the effectiveness of sanctions against Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. Democratic leaders have largely cohered around this message. Um, but experts say the cut is targeted squarely at the Democratic Party, something Democratic officials, officials have been loath to admit publicly. The Saudis are well aware that the price of gasoline at the pump has been a crucial political issue in the United States since 1973. Bruce, Bruce Rydell, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, told The Intercept in an email. They want a big increase to help the Republicans, he added, explaining that MBS sees the GOP winning back Congress as the first step to Trump winning in 2024 and a setback for Biden. In 1973, Saudi Arabia led an oil embargo designed to punish the U.S. and other countries that supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Then in 1979, Saudi Arabia again led an oil embargo, this time in the wake of the Iranian Revolution, with the resultant high gas prices playing an arguably decisive role in Jimmy Carter's loss to Ronald Reagan in the 1980 presidential race. Carter famously placed solar panels on the roof of the White House in a symbolic plea for the importance of the U.S. extricating itself from oil dependency, a gesture for which he was ridiculed. MBS's rule has seen this power wielded in an acutely partisan way. MBS complied with Donald Trump's oil production requests in two election years, once in 2018 by increasing oil production to bring down prices, and again in 2020 by lowering production, which Trump wanted to protect the domestic American shale industry battered by low demand brought on by the pandemic downturn. 
MBS enjoyed a sweetheart relationship with Trump, Rydell said. Trump stood by MBS when he murdered Khashoggi and his war in Yemen, which has starved tens of thousands of children. There was never any criticism of the Saudis' human rights abuses from the Trump administration. Trump jettisoned longstanding presidential tradition by paying his first foreign visit as president to Riyadh, where he was showered in gifts and inked a record-breaking $350 billion weapon sale to the kingdom. He also vetoed three separate congressional bills that would have blocked arms sales to Riyadh and reported, uh, bragged, reportedly bragged about shielding MBS from con- consequences for the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi, saying, I saved his ass. You don't need to look hard to understand that MBS is deliberately and persistently acting against U.S. interests and the Biden administration in particular. His actions are not just snubs, but punches in the face, said Sarah Leah Whitson, executive director of Democracy in the Arab World Now. He's very nakedly using oil as a lever to try to influence the midterm elections with the aim of bringing in more compliant Republicans trying to show us all who's boss, even in our own democracy. (laughs) The notion that Saudi Arabia could intervene in domestic American politics for Boten in Washington has been publicly acknowledged by top Saudi officials themselves in an Arabic language interview for the Saudi state-funded talk show Spotlights. In May 2004, Prince Bandar bin Sultan al Saud, the Saudi ambassador to the U.S. from 1983 to 2006, said the quiet part out loud. The kingdom's oil decisions can influence the election or non-election of the president of the United States, the largest and strongest country in the world. For that to be taken into consideration, regardless of what the kingdom decides to do, is in itself evidence of the strategic weight for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And that's that's pretty <clears throat> that's that's a lot of power, right? If you can if you can influence more so than you know Putin uh, tipping the election for Trump or something something something, right? More than anything else, you know the people with the real power, Saudi Arabia and maybe other oil producing countries that can, you know, Russia has some power on in that regard as well but if they can turn off the tap and and tell the current administration like good luck that's that's uh that's pretty powerful and it also speaks to the power of oil itself right because we're so dependent on oil we're so oh my god we need the oil we need it so bad that if there's any, you know, if there's a disruption in the flow, if there's, you know, like a serious disruption in the flow, oh my God, everything's going to fall apart. We could lose, you know, we could lose everything. Again, going back to the earlier part in this story where the other nations in the Middle East were saying, no, don't, you know, we can't have these cuts so deep because that actually might cause the entire world to go into a recession and that would be bad for the oil industry. Now, we don't want that. That's how powerful fossil fuels are to the planet. If probably the most, you know, the most single most important commodity on the planet is oil and fossil fuels. And again, if you don't think that they're, you know, that single most uh, powerful entity, just like big pharma, just like, you know, big ag, just like big everything else, that entity isn't so, you know, is so powerful, isn't interested in convincing people that there is no problem with the, what they're doing to the world on a daily basis, aka climate change. That they're not doing everything in their po- power to seed people's minds with the idea that it's, it's not happening. It's just, no, it's, uh, no. You might be just a little naive um in another interview with bob woodward in 2004 bandar said president bill clinton asked us to keep prices down 
in the year 2000. In fact, I can ge- I can go back to 1979. President Carter asked us to keep the prices down to avoid the melees. <clears throat> that didn't work out so well for him. In October 2018, following news of the grisly murder of Khashoggi, a column by then chief of Saudi Arabia's state-run media outlet Al Arabiya, or Arabia, excuse me, uh, threatened economic disaster if the U.S. sanctioned Riyadh. If U.S. sanctions are imposed on Saudi Arabia, we'll, we will be facing an economic disaster that would rock the entire world, wrote Turkey uh, al Dakil who is now Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the UAE. It would lead to Saudi Arabia's failure to commit to producing 7.5 million barrels of oil. None of this is to say that Saudi Arabia under MBS hasn't pursued cozier relations with Russia. MBS's intensifying relationship with Putin dates back to June 2015 when frustrated that President Barack Obama had rebuffed MBS's request for a meeting the then Deputy Crown Prince instead opted to meet with Putin on the sidelines of the 19th, uh, 19th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, as The Intercept previously reported. Left with few options, the Biden administration this week announced that it would release 15 million barrels of oil from the strategic oil reserves. Has anybody seen the graph showing the oil reserves going down, 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 down? That's not good either. The White House is also considering, you know, not... Not in the immediate. The White House is also considering lifting sanctions to Venezuela to mitigate the... Oh, oh, come here, you guys. I'm sorry. We didn't mean all that. I know. We were trying to... Maduro, I'm sorry, man. I know, I know. We were trying to get you out of office and tried to assassinate you and, you know, tried to starve your people and, you know, tried to ruin your economy and, you know. But, you know, oh, geez, you know, that was... That's, you know, this is politics, bro. <laughs> we need some oil. Ooh, we. That does not look good. The White House is also considering lifting sanctions on Venezuela to mitigate the economic harm of OPEC Plus's production cut, a move that some experts have for years been calling for. The U.S. has helped artificially make Saudi Arabia more powerful in the en- energy markets by sanctioning the oil of other major producers. Trita Parsi executive vice president of the Quincy Institute, told The Intercept, just as the Secretary of State Tony Blinken said that the, that the destruction of the Nord Stream gas pipeline was an opportunity for Europe to reduce its dependence on Russian gas. Biden should turn the current crisis into an opportunity to, to reduce its own dependence on Riyadh by rethinking its, its unsuccessful energy sanctions on Venezuela and Iran. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Um, Phantom, I'm going to take your call in one moment. Um, so we're going to take a break here. Uh, that, you know, it's very insightful and shed a lot of light on the situation. I think that article. Uh, check in the coffees. No coffees yet as of today. Again, buymeacoffee.com slash News. Good way to support the show. Uh, don't have any more tips on Rockfin as of yet. So we're going to take this call from Phantomas. How's it going? Good day to you. What's up, man? How you doing? Yeah, um, I was just uh, just listening to all of the uh, problems around the world. And uh, one of the things that I saw that was uh, interesting to me is there's this candy company that makes... Uh, uh, they, 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 they're called climate candy. They make imperfect produce into candy. And I wonder if you think that that's a somewhat bullshit. Cause it doesn't I, don't know, like... I don't even understand that. I don't know. So they, so they, so they take the fruit, the Im- imperfect fruit. Let me see what their bio says. We did it. We turned problems into candy, introducing faves, your new fave source of fruits and veggies made from unharvested, unharvested, perfectly imperfect produce. The reason is sweet because fruits are sweet. It sounds almost like a money laundering scheme. <laughs> it's just that's weird. Yeah, I don't. I still don't get it because it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I get sure. I guess you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It seems like it would be like uh, to to have a factory to make candy. You're causing more problems. <laughs> I right. would think. But maybe, but maybe it is helping the environment. I don't know. Is it? I yeah. I mean, I would think that you could. 
I, there would be other things that you could do with that imperfect stuff, you know, I guess. But, um, you know, hopefully, I mean, you would, you would also hope that, um, like, food uh, uh, growers and shippers and, and all that would already have a really, you know, good way to deal with the, the quote unquote waste, right? But, or maybe not, but maybe they all just run, you know, function on stupid. Maybe they're just like, the, you know, oh, it's not good enough, throw it out, whatever. And there's just big pile, uh, you know, that's probably the reality is there's just big piles of rotting food outside <laughs> yeah. of these distribution centers because they're, you know, oh, these don't look right. Or, you, you know, know, or in the back of grocery stores, right? How, how much yeah. input perfect food is thrown away behind a grocery store or not far away from a grocery <laughs> store because people aren't going to buy it and you see that i i see that every day i go to the store and there's like you know a pile of avocados or tomatoes or whatever yeah. it is and like they're starting to kind of go you know they got to get them out of there <clears throat> where did all of those go I, I would think it would be better to feed to the homeless or to people rather than to make it into candy because all we, the pulp we couldn't do that because then <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, you would yeah, then yeah. you would be negating yeah. the the value of the food you know Whatever, and then right. someone would come to you and say, "Are you feeding imperfect produce to the homeless?" Right, right. But it's, but the it's other a thing, thing, yeah, yeah. But the other thing I wanted to bring up is this common thing that we see in politics and narratives where they say we need to build more factories. And to me, it's so interesting that nobody, even in the climate days, in terms of all the leaders, they don't say, "No, we don't need to build more factories. We have plenty of factories." It's always right. No, we need to build more. It. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody says it. And nobody it's, it's interesting that. because it, it, we just continue going on this path and making it worse for the people around the world with all of our factories. Yeah. I mean, building stuff is just a, a knee jerk. Like we, we must do it. Anytime somebody says, Hey, let's build some stuff. People are like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> sounds good. Right. That's, that's a great idea. Let's build more stuff. You just can't, you know, you can't ever suggest that maybe building more stuff is not, not the answer, but yeah, um, well, I'm going to leave it there. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, Appreciate later. it. Fantamous. Uh, yeah. That's that, you know, yeah, I, <laughs> I have about eight, eight things I want to say all at once. Uh, I can't choose. I can't figure out which one to to uh, vocalize. Anyways, um, let's keep going. I guess I'll just get through what I can get through today. I'm gonna miss some stuff today, and maybe I'll have to bring it back tomorrow. But there's there was so much. Anytime I miss a day of the show, it just becomes um my my show uh organization becomes like imperfect food at the grocery store i'm just i'm leaving out a lot of stuff you know i'm only trying to take the juiciest sweetest morsels and bring them to you but fortunately this is not these stories are not waste that could probably be feeding somebody um they're just just an overabundance of news and information which will always be there. We'll always cycle back around in another form eventually. Um, all right, this is an interesting question from Peter Dines. Which major US city will be the first to become uninhabitable due to climate change? Salt Lake City, Vegas, Phoenix, Miami? Answers and explanations, please. And you know, well, interestingly, somebody says Portland, Oregon. They say because the trees are under stress and could be like fire could just i guess take out maybe fire will will take out a bunch of places or portland itself i don't know miami somebody says new orleans denver um somebody says jackson mississippi because somebody said somebody said the play you know a place with little economic wealth right the places with less economic wealth 
will be more vulnerable more quickly. I don't know. What do you all what do you all think? Andre says Phoenix and Las Vegas. I, I actually you know what? I'm gonna go <laughs> I, I actually agree with that. I think Phoenix Las and Las Vegas will be first. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna I'm gonna give my own hometown a thumbs down. Los Angeles will be very early to go. Why? Water. Water. There is a lot of people here. This is a desert. And not only that, we are prone to have, you know, we're prone to heat here. Um, it's been one of the, you know, we're in the Southwest. We're prone to heat. Um, so I actually see Los Angeles as being extremely vulnerable. Los Angeles is extremely vulnerable. Uh, not as vulnerable as Vegas or Phoenix. Los Angeles is, you know, there's just a lot of people here. There's a lot of people here. And I don't know. Those are my votes. But um, somebody, so, well, somebody posted this. Phoenix, ex excessive heat kills more people than any other climate calamity. And that, you know, this is probably a good guess. Phoenix is probably a good guess to be first to go. Um, alarm as fastest growing U.S. cities risk becoming unlivable from climate crisis. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it just, uh, maybe other cities in the South, not necessarily because, m mostly because of heat and, and not maybe uh, less water and more because electric, electric generation goes down. It becomes very, you know, it's very hot. Things get hotter, you know, at some point the heat actually, and everybody trying to stay cool to cool themselves, to stay alive, right. Will overload the system. You just cannot generate that much electricity. That's another, you know, so you could, you could apply that metric to Phoenix, Las Vegas, and like, you know, cities all across the South, Texas, Louisiana, Florida, right. Just too hot, too much electricity generation um you know wet bulb temperatures i don't who knows when that might happen who knows but uh i don't know if there's any betting odds on that anybody know of any you know betting books <laughs> that are taking odds on the first city to collapse in the u.s because of climate change could be a good thing to bet on i don't know but will anybody be around to collect the bet that's <laughs> that's the question that's the question oh i was looking at this article a little bit cities in the sun belt and yet all of these cities are building 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 more 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 we're expanding the freeways and expanding the if infrastructure more yeah i know it's cheap living but i don't know if that cheap living is good reason to pile in i just don't know you gotta you you probably gotta understand if you're going to one of these cities for the cheap living that that is an ultra temporary situation you should be ready you should have your go bags together there was a mashed potato attack on a monet in germany i know i know some people are cheering this on some people are like this is stupid but these are just top oil folks i i don't know <clears throat> It's hard for me because I, I really love art. <laughs> so uh, as I know that the Van Gogh was not hurt. <clears throat> I don't know if this one is covered in glass. Um, so maybe it doesn't really matter. I just, I love art. So there's a, a part of me that's like, 
cringes a little bit. <laughs> Let me see this. But still, um, in the in the scheme of things, it, as important as maybe you know the survival of every species on the planet, this might be small. This is a s- small potato. Sorry, <laughs> had to do it. Anyways, mashed potatoes on a mon- Monet as a climate protest. Uh, I don't know. Going back to the article about the how oil runs the world, like I just okay, I get the message: just stop oil. But you just you just that me- I, you know I have a problem with that kind of level of simplicity in the messaging, and I'm glad that people are getting are calling attention to this but i just hey you're just you're not gonna just stop oil that ain't gonna happen i mean it would be nice but you you've got to really like you've got to you got to do a whole lot of things before you just stop oil you got to educate people you have to allow people to like make a transition you've got to you really have to do a lot of foundational building in people's minds before you just stop oil because you just stop oil Pretty much the entire economy of the planet collapses. Like everything goes, everything is done. And so I, I, I don't. Uh, I have a lot of feelings about this. It's fine. I, I always support protest energy. I always support. You know, people getting out there and putting themselves on the line to change the world for the better. I, I. I always support that, but I don't support the simplistic messaging. The simplistic messaging is not kind of not helpful. And it actually actually might create you know the wrong kind of backlash. Hey Jenny, I'm just I'm seeing some comments from Jenny on Colin. Oh, you have a channel, Jenny? Um, Healthyfamilies.substack.com. Okay, well, everybody go. Jenny has some articles there if you guys want to check those out. Healthyfamilies.substack.com. Uh, Nivek is asking me, I want. do I want explanations about these protests? Um, I mean... It's, I know that it's hard and I know that's the way that, you know, you have to, you have to simplify your message in order to get people, you know, I don't know, but it's just something, something about the messaging of just like, we just have to stop these oil companies now. I just, uh, that, A, that's a, that is a recipe for disaster. You know, if, if we, you know, if, if the, nations of the world suddenly came together and just closed all the factor all the uh you know all the just closed down all the oil, you know oil companies if we did that just like without any advancement you know of like you know advance messaging like hey guys we're gonna go we're gonna do this and it's gonna whoa it is gonna hurt like you could really gotta it's unfortunate that it's such a complicated issue and it's unfortunate that it's so nuanced that you can't just give people a simple message. You've got to actually give people more, but I think you have to, you have to assume you have to trust that people are smart enough to get the whole message and not uh, just stop oil. You can't just stop oil. You can't, you can't do it. I mean, you could, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty nasty thing to do. I know. We're destroying the planet with burning the oil. I know. I get it. Poppy says simplistic messaging is the only thing that makes the news. Right. And uh, people are living on this like soundbite in the soundbite world and maybe maybe we we maybe we shouldn't do that. All right, I'm going to take this call from Jenny. How you doing, Jenny? Are you there? Jenny? It's the first time calling in on my laptop. Can you hear me okay? 
Yeah. Can you uh, okay. give, me, give me one second? Uh, I, I just want to read this comment from Rick Small. If they shut down the fossil fuel economy, the children, if they don't shut it down, the children of humanity and creation go extinct. Um, well, yeah, it's still, it's still, you know, even that, you know, no, no, no disrespect Rick small. I think you're a very smart person, but even that has his problems. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about that. Anyways. Well, Jenny, how's it going? What's on your mind? Good. I was just thinking about Europe and so much of Europe is set up to do on foot or with bikes or, you know, corner store. We are not set up for that in America. And right. even the best intention cities, which I personally live in the best intention city, we have more bike paths than anywhere else in the world in Boulder County. And there's strong incentive and push to do everything on your bike. And I did for years, I did everything on my bike. It was my car. And I pulled my kids around in a burly trailer and I shopped and we did everything on the bike and the bus. Nice. But then the winter comes. Right. And children have to be fed. Right. And there was one day I was sitting at the corner in front of an Albertsons waiting for the bus to come with to two toddlers. And the wind blew in like it does in Boulder, it, you know, like a normal 50 mile an hour wind. And it was cold. And the, the weather here in Colorado can change on a dime. You can have a wonderful morning of 70 degree weather. And then within five minutes, it can be bitter cold. And it was one of those days in the fall. And I was like, you know what? We're going to have to get a car. We had done that whole summer without a car to see if we could do it. Right. You know, our car had died. Well, and we're and like, good let's, on you. Good on you for trying. Yeah, yeah. Let's see how long we can make it. Right. And we were fine until it got cold and I had babies to feed. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know what? We got to get a car, you know? And so these are the realities you're talking about mm -hmm. that even with the best of intentions and, and the desire in your heart to do it, um, there's reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, and 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 that's right. And so many, it's well, <clears throat> you're pointing up the issue that you know we're, everybody is kind of trapped in this system, you know, and people have to live like people survive by doing the things that need to be done in order to navigate this system, and so um, that's that's the trap. That's why it's so difficult to stop you know, just get out of the system and just, Oh, I'm just going to go live off the land. Or I'm just going to go right. Like it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of, uh, negotiation with like all kinds of things, right? Nature and money and whatever, you know? Well, like, and as a homemaker, you know, I was home with my kids. Everything I had to do was double. It took twice as long as if I had had a car, right, you have right. to wait for the bus. You have right. to wait for the bus to come back and pick you up. Right. And a bus, you know, has to make stops. So a trip that could take 10 minutes in a car just took an hour, right. you know? And so as that expands your day, um, which I was fine at the time, you know, I had little kids, we enjoyed the bus rides. There came a time when I didn't have time for that. And it was when my kids were in high school and we were flying by the seat of our pants, going to soccer games and gymnastics meets and doing all the stuff you have to do with busy kids. Right. And the only way we could have survived was with the car. And so we had one car and, you know, I did my grocery shopping on the weekends and the nights. So we weren't driving two cars. We tried to be conscious about it, but we had to have a car. Right. And this is, again, is reality. So thank you so much for taking my call and yeah. for mentioning my sub stack. Yeah, I, sure. I tried to make movies on current events. I okay. don't spend a lot of time typing or giving text content. I make these movies and I try to make them entertaining. So I was just commiserating with you that it was a very uh, oh, newsworthy, right. newsworthy weekend, very busy weekend for the news. So I made two yeah. movies instead of one. But I so appreciate the plug. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Thanks for calling in, Jenny. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, yeah, that I that's you know, we we live in a system where we we have to, you know, and it's hard to set up set yourself up to live without doing all the things. And so, you know, <clears throat> it's very complicated. I you know, I I I agree with the idea of just stop oil. I agree with the idea that we should stop burning oil. I, um, I think it's the right thing to do, but you can't just do it. 
you know, and let people fend for themselves. You just can't do that. You would, you would be committing a lot of people to death. And that, like, literally, that's the reality of that. And that's, you know, not the way to do it, I don't think. I think you should, <clears throat> you know, if you're going to do it, if you're going to be serious about it, and I don't think anybody's serious about it right now, but if you're going to be serious about it, you, you would allow for people to have a way to transition to another way of living that doesn't require all the oil. And it would have to be a structured, but very steep decline. You're not just, just stopping oil. Just stopping oil is just way simplistic and it's actually not very intelligent. But if you're like, we need to get off oil in you know five years or 10 years, whatever the time frame is, and probably all of that is too short, uh, who knows? But like, you're gonna have to say like, here's the, here's the goal, here's what you need to do in order to, and as we can see, uh, right now, all of the messaging around, cli you know, around climate change or d the d denial of its existence is like, uh, oh, you're asking me to do what? <laughs> you're going to tell me I'm going to have to do what to fight climate change? Up yours, buddy. You know, that's like the, that's the reaction. So we're going to need a lot more communication, a lot more understanding from people if there's even a chance of doing anything whatsoever. And I don't know if throwing potatoes, mashed potatoes on a Monet certainly will get people's attention, but I don't know if it's going to do one jack about the problem. I mean, I don't know. And I don't know what measurement one jack is, but it's not going to do anything for the problem. Creative experiment says work from home stops a lot of traffic. Yep. And I'm all for it. I'm all for the work at home thing. I'm all for the you know, Zoom meetings and the and a lot of people are like, no, that's you. We just can't have that. Why not? Why not? I don't do the Zoom meetings and the Zoom concerts and the Zoom things. I'm just chill. I don't know. Um all right, guys, that about does it for me. That's about all my time. I did get another tip on Rockfin, and this is from Osama. It says, dedication to my mom, Mary. 1924 to 2022, she loved your music, Kevin. Oh, Osama, thank you, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear about your mom. I'm sorry, brother, but thank you. And, uh, and thank you for letting me know that she, she liked my music. Thank you. Uh, all right, y'all. I'm going to end on that and I will see you all here at 12 PM Pacific daylight time. Uh, see you here tomorrow and until next time, peace.